Good. So thank you very much for being with us today in our next edition of the LibreHub seminar. And today we have the pleasure of welcoming Oliver Pills. He's a marine, marine biologist uh, working at the UK Research Innovation Future Leaders Fellow at the University of Plymouth. He is building open source bioimaging hardware and analytical software for high dimensional phenotyping and applying these to assessing the sensitivity of the earliest and most dynamic stages of life. So uh, thank you very much for being with us, uh, Oliver. Well, our seminar today, uh, we have uh, until the end of the hour. So uh, hopefully we can dedicate some time for questions uh, before we get to that time. And besides yeah. that, um, and, and welcoming you, uh, please go ahead and tell us about embryo phenomics. Brilliant. Thanks, Vincent. Okay, so um, so my research is, um, or, or the research of our group really, is, 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 is focused around early life stages. So it's focused around the stages of life that if you go to the seaside, if you go to a rocky shore, um, you're unlikely to find unless you really look, look for them. Um, so we're interested in crabs and fish and snails and shrimp, um, you know, all of those types of animals, but we're interested in them at their various, uh, very earliest stages of life, you know, so when they're only a couple of millimetres, um, you know, in, in size. So we still get to go to beautiful, um, beautiful locations to sample, um, but quite often we don't really know what we've sampled until we get back to the lab. And the animals that we work with look very different. So, for example, if I um, you know, if I ask a, a school child to, to draw a picture of a crab or even a sort of a, a, a biologist, um, you know, a, a graduate, um, they're likely to, to draw you a, a, an adult crab. Um, but what's really interesting to us is that that adult crab has already kind of gone through this hugely dynamic period of, 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 of life whereby it's had to exist in a completely different environment, i.e. It, it's lived in the plankton. It's gone through larval stages that look completely different to how it looks as an adult. Um, it's got to have a whole host of different strategies for dealing with the, the various pressures that are kind of in, inherent in, in being a sort of a, a larval, larval early life stage crab. And so on this slide, we've got some videos, uh, which I'm going to attempt ambitiously to play so there are some more but these ones don't seem to want to play um so on the right hand side we've got jellyfish polyps so these sort of um jelly um jelly masses that you can sort of see um wiggling around on the microscope slide these are jellyfish polyps so these are the stages of life before the jellyfish metamorphose and become planktonic um down here um can't get this one going. Um, so, so, so um, on the left side of the screen, we've got a jellyfish ephyra. So this is the first stage of the planktonic um, jellyfish. So essentially, you get a metamorphosis from these polyps to becoming a free swimming ephyra. Now, we're really interesting to, interested in these ephyra because the jellyfish are, uh, are sort of neutrally buoyant, typically. So an adult jellyfish floats around um, in, in the water column with little effort, um, whereas these ephyra are actually dense. So if at any point they stop swimming, they sink. Um, and as soon as they touch anything like the sea floor, um, they will then um, become stuck. Um, so essentially they will die. And that becomes really problematic in terms of the environment. So for example, if they experience reduced oxygen in the water column, um, they can reduce their swimming speed and as a result sort of drop, drop in, the, in the plankton. Um, jumping back again to get the video started, here we've got sand hoppers. Um, so um, this is a, a, a sort of an interesting species, lives on the strand line and um, digs down into the sand. And this is its embryonic stage. So this is an egg from one, one millimeter in, in length from, from here to here. And it's got a long tubular heart running along its back. Um, you can just about make out its eye um, and hopefully some appendages here. And this is several hours later. So this is it hatching, hatching from its egg breaking through of the egg. And as soon as it's hatched, you know, it's got a completely different form of life. Here it can't do very much apart from flex and sort of development, develop its physiology. Um, but as soon as it's out in the environment, it's having to respond to a whole host of different, um, yeah, different drivers. And then finally over here on the left, um, a species that I work a lot with, um, an intertidal gastropod um, called Litterina obtusata. And this one's particularly interesting because um, it's got two hearts. So it actually develops a larval heart for one week of its development. 
Um, so it develops over about a month, so four weeks. Um, and for one week, it develops a larval heart. And this larval heart beats with a completely different rhythm to the adult heart. And it also responds to environmental drivers in different ways. So for example, if this embryo um, is exposed to hypoxia, so reduced oxygen during, during its development, which is something that's becoming more common with climate change, um, that larval heart is crucial to it being able to survive that stress. So there's some of the species that we work with, but um, um, as was touched on in the introduction, I'm a marine biologist, so, so we're really spoilt for choice. We don't have a model species. We work with any species that's sort of interesting to, to the questions that we want to ask. And that's really been central to the development of our technologies as well. So everything that we do, we kind of do within the context of the Anthropocene, um, which I'm sure most people have, have heard about, um, you know, given that this is much more prominent in sort of um, in, in, in the public sphere now. Um, but it's this, it's this rather depressing geological age where we are, you know, having a really negative impact on the environment and, and obviously changing the environment of the animals that we as marine biologists at least um, study. So a lot of our research has a kind of a, an Anthropocene component in that we're thinking about, okay, well, if we put animals into these conditions, they're potentially going to become much more common to these animals in, in the future. Um, so essentially, we're, we're, we're sort of looking at the development of animals um, as it might look like in sort of 50 or 100 years time. And um, I mean, uh, embryonic development um, is something that fascinates me. You know, I, I find it sort of a, a, an interesting, uh, uh, an interesting period of development to watch. It's dynamic. There's a huge amount going on. And it's it's sort of at this you know, at the beginning of an animal's life. So it's got this opportunity to sort of have this influence over um, essentially the rest of the animal's um, life, assuming it has a successful embryonic develop development. But embryonic development is also really important evolutionarily. Um, you know, so what do I mean by that? Well, um, this phrase at the bottom, so the evolution of form occurs through changes in development, I think is a really important one. So, um, so we know that different species develop in different ways. Um, and you can see that here in, um, in some comparisons of uh, different chordate um, groups. Um, and this was work that was done um, 30 or so years ago as a way of showing that embryonic development is really, um, there's a huge amount of variation. Um, you know, so different species grow differently at pretty much every stage of their development. Because a long time ago, um, so sort of back in the, the early 1900s, late 1800s, there, there was lots of controversy around the idea of how animals develop. Um, and that was very tied up in sort of uh, um, conceptions around religion, um, conceptions around how evolution occurs. So, so there's been lots of progress since then, um, but um, I think what, it, um, what figures like this help to show is that apart from embryonic development being fascinating at a sort of a, a, a sort of um, a, a, almost like an artistic level, um, it's really important evolutionarily because it was even Darwin who picked up on the idea that natural selection at the very earliest stages of development might be very important. And I'm not going to go into great detail here, but a sort of a, another simplistic way of looking at this is that we know that changes in development have been crucial to the evolution of different life forms. Um, you know, everything from going to unicellular to multicellular life, um, you know, from bilaterians to segmented animals. So we know that these developmental divergences have been really important. Now, a lot of what we do, um, because I've sort of touched on the idea of embryonic development being really dynamic, so a, a lot of what we do is around trying to capture as much of this information as possible. Um, and I'll go into a little bit more detail a, a, about that. Um, but we're using the concept of phenomics. Um, so I think most sort of like practicing biologists or, or even sort of students of biology now are kind of familiar with the concept of genomics. So you can sort of sequence the genome of any animal really that you can get enough material from. And you, as a result, can sort of piece together what its genome looks like. So you can get a huge amount of information about life at the molecular level. Um, but we've not kept pace with the ability to do that at the phenotypic level. So by phenotypic, I kind of mean the, an organism's observable characteristics. So phenomics has been the kind of um, the, 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 
proposed solution to that. So it's the acquisition of high dimensional data on an organism wide scale. So by that, I mean, for example, being able to measure as many things that you can see in, a, in an organism as possible. Um, and one of the big challenges here is that every animal looks different um, and, it, and, and, and most animals work differently. So there's, there's huge uh, variation around um, the sort of biodiversity and how you know, different, different forms of life uh, exist in terms of their phenotype. Um, and this has arguably been one of the challenges around this idea of phenomics. Um, you, know, you might be able to measure the, the beating heart of a zebrafish, um, but for example, those um, those shrimp, the, the, the sand hoppers, um, you know, their heart looks very different. They've got a long tubular heart. So how, how, how do you measure that? Um, if you measure the heart of a shrimp and compare it to the heart of a zebrafish, are you comparing like with like or, or are you comparing apples and oranges, for example? So there's lots of there's lots of fairly fundamental um, unknowns around how we deal with um, sort of phenotypic variation. And when you start to scale that up to the level of, like we see in, in, in genomics, um, that becomes really problematic. Um, so, I mean, this figure is a, is a sort of simplistic view of, um, of sort of like clinical phenomics. Um, so um, you probably heard of the idea of individualized medicine. So it's the idea that we will all at some stage have enough information about ourselves or at least our doctors will um, to be able to make decisions about our treatment on the basis of, you know, our exact biology. So, you know, our transcriptome, our metabolome, our phenome, all of these bits of information. Um, so it's this idea of being able to kind of like integrate different levels of information to then make um, make decisions around, for example, treatment. So um, so embryonic development, um, as, I've, as I've, I've, I feel like I'm giving a really hard sell, um, but embryonic development is, 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 is great. There's a huge amount you can measure. Um, so it's really dynamic sort of temporally, spatially and functionally. So, I mean, it changes during time, obviously, as the animal grows. Changes spatially, again, as the animal grows, it gets bigger, it changes in shape, and it changes functionally because, you know, as an organism develops, um, not only its morphology develops, but so do so too does its physiology. Um, so let me get this one playing. Um, so this is a, a snail embryo, and it's going all the way from its first cell division through to hatching. Um, so again, this embryo is about a millimetre in length. And it's 10 day developments. This is 10 days at 20 degrees. Um, you can see here sort of compressed into a 30 second or so video. And some of the things that we like to measure in these animals are things like um, rates of development and growth rates, when particular things happen. So for example, when its heart starts beating, when it starts doing a particular behavior, Interested in measuring uh, things like its physiological performance. So, for example, if you take this animal and put it into a higher temperature, how, how, does, how does that affect it? How, how does that affect its performance? How does that affect its ability to be able to still grow if you put it into a more, um, a more um, demanding environment? And then also interested in this idea of changes in size and shape. Interestingly, with these animals, they actually have to eat their way out of the egg. Um, so that's kind of like you, you can look at the entire development of the animal and then you get to this sort of last day or two um, where essentially some animals or some snails will just work it out very quickly and be able to you know, eat their way out of the egg and, 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 they'll, and they'll hatch. Whereas others seem to really struggle with this and sort of for five days or so just um, just remain inside these eggs. So, so what is phenomics? Um, it's been termed a little bit um, or compared to the idea of putting Humpty Dumpty back together again. So I don't know if you're familiar with this, it's a nursery rhyme. Um, uh, so um, the idea is Humpty Dumpty fell off a wall and fell apart. Um, and then uh, the king's uh, guards had to come back and you know, essentially put this, put this egg back together again. So it's really sort of silly, um, yeah, silly nursery rhyme. Um, and it's been used um, within the context of the human physiome project. Uh, so essentially sort of trying to model on all of the physiology of the human body. Um, and I think it's quite nice because it's this, this idea that actually we can understand lots of individual pieces of the biology. So, for example, we can understand the physiology of the of the heart and how the heart beats. And we might be able to understand the physiology of another part of the um, um, part of humans in this in this instance. But how do you bring all of that back together? And actually sort of assemble it into a into a kind of coherent whole so again within the context of the genome um, you know when you sequence a genome you get a huge amount of information about the entire 
genome. Um, but the challenge is then being able to integrate all of that into a kind of um, in, 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 into an understanding of the whole. Um, so um, yeah, so 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 as I say, um, phenomics has been sort of suggested as as, as, as being this um, this this potential solution um, to, to the challenge. Um, and um, although there's a huge amount of information in the phenome, the challenge is that the diversity, the the, the different types of information, are arguably much more um, uh, variable. So here in Plymouth. Um, I, um, I started a PhD um, some like 15 years ago now, um, or thereabouts, um, and um, I was coming in um, sort of on the back of a, 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 um, a PhD student, so just after a PhD student who was finishing, who'd um, for the first time compared the development of many species of snail um, and shown that changes in the timing of when particular things happened were really important to the evolution of this group. Now, we, similar work had been done in um, using fossils um, and invertebrates, but it had never been done in invertebrates. This was a really important study. But the downside of it was that it meant that this um, poor lady, Jenny, um, had been spending uh, weeks or months of her life in a lab, staring down a microscope. Um, some of the events that she was interested in happened very close together. Um, and so she you know, would go for lunch and come back and things will have happened and she'd have no idea which order they'd happened in. Um, so she sort of resorted to, and I'm sure many, or, or, I mean, it's not necessarily something you should encourage, but um, many people have slept at their desks or, or in labs. Um, and unfortunately, um, I think Jenny had done this a little bit too much and decided that actually science, um, yeah, um, she, she, she'd sort of done her time. Um, so she decided that she wasn't going to carry on in research, um, but her work really set the scene for everything that, that came after in this area. And what was particularly interesting was her advice to me, which was to find a better way. She said, it doesn't matter how long it takes, but you have to find a better way of being able to study the development of animals um, because this is just not sustainable. And after, otherwise, after three years, you will have had enough. Um, so, so I, I, I had an incredibly uh, supportive supervisors um, and uh, they allowed me to essentially spend six months trying to find a better way and finding, um, you know, small amounts of money, small budgets to, um, to, to, to buy pieces of, of equipment. So here what we've got is what we call an open BIM, so an open source video microscope. Um, and we use this system for being able to scan the development of hundreds of developing embryos. And to do this while we control the environment, so we can heat and cool the animals, we can also control uh, mixtures of uh, gases. Um, so we've got the ability to essentially kind of recreate different environments and see how embryos develop in those different environments. Um, so I'll go into a little bit more detail um, in terms of the technology later on, but I mean, fundamentally it is a digital microscope, so a camera and a lens um, positioned above a, 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 a motorized stage. Um, we're then using a kind of an off-the-shelf incubation chamber. Um, I don't think that was me, but maybe it was. Um, and um, and uh, we're controlling everything with a micromanager, um, so the ImageJ uh, plugin. And these have worked really well for a long period of time. Um, the, um, the hardware itself, um, the, the sort of framework and the, and the various bits to fix everything together um, was from um, a... Um, um, uh, was produced by an engineering uh, company or, or um, engineers within the university. So um, the, the way the system works is to uh, image large numbers of embryos um, uh, over a long period of time. Um, so essentially the system will run for as long as there is space. You know, so as long as there is space in terms of the, um, the, uh, the data, um, data storage. Um, and we generate videos at each time point. Um, so at every time point, we generate a video of an individual animal, and that allows us not just to look at its size and its shape, but actually to sort of see how, how, its, how its physiology looks, how it's performing, um, and measure things like its spinning rate or its heart rate. Um, and all of these things are flexible, so we can work with lenses as low as sort of half times, up to sort of 5,000 times, um, and um, we can also change you know, the recording duration. So for example, we've done experiments where we've just recorded the entire development of one animal non-stop so essentially had a camera running for several weeks just to actually see what sort of sampling resolution you need to be able to fully capture um, the development of an animal 
Um, and we've used these systems with anything from snails to jellyfish. Um, so essentially anything that you can culture in a multi-world plate. But we've also done work with uh, microfluidic systems. Um, so again, they're pretty versatile in terms of what they can accommodate. So this is a, an example of some of the video that you get. Um, so um, 20 and 25 degrees, again, this is a snail. Um, and if you look at the top left-hand corner, we've sort of switched from fast forward to real time. So at any point during the development, you can kind of pause the time lapse and look at what's going on in real time. Um, and this is a sort of really powerful aspect of, of the approach because we're interested not just in, in growth, but we're interested in the physiology of the animal. And the physiology is really important within the context of you know, its size, its shape, and things, things like that. So a five degree different in, difference in temperature in this species um, leads to actually greater than a 0.5 increase in, in speed. Um, so the animal um, develops dramatically faster at 25 degrees. Um, but then we also sort of looked at this in terms of a performance curve and from 25 to 30, um, the speed drops right down and the animal seems to really struggle. So its final size is significantly smaller. And these, just to say, actually, these are temperatures that these animals see. Um, so this summer, for example, we've um, seen this species in temperatures as high as sort of 36 degrees in small streams. Um, so they are experiencing um, a really kind of broad temperature range. And although we see them as high as 36 degrees on the same day, you can see a temperature range of 15. You know, So they're getting right down from sort of 18 degrees up to 36. So it's a huge, huge temperature range. Um, and then when you look at sort of the different life stages, um, that's where the kind of the physiological diversity really kind of hits home, you know, so here you've got everything from a, a spinning, uh, spinning trochophore here in the center. Um, so this is um, spinning, uh, spinning around inside its egg, really important for processes like mixing, so mixing the, the contents of the egg. Um, we've got uh, top left hand corner, you can see the heartbeat. Um, so the heart's beating and the sort of the front left corner of the embryo um, after it's moved. So during the process of snail development, this, the, essentially the whole back half of the animal, is, its mantle rotates 180 degrees. And in that process, so too does the heart. Um, and finally, we've got the um, down at the bot bottom right corner. Um, so the, when embryologists first saw, saw this, um, they described it as the hippo stage. So it's a snail embryo, um, but it's described as the hippo stage, and, and that, that name is sort of stuck. So here we've got the early eyes forming, and then also we've got a sort of very weak heartbeat towards the, towards the back of the animal. So there's a huge amount of different biology evident in these videos, and what you can see in, in the development of the embryo changes on a on a day-by-day even hour by hour basis. Okay, so we had two major problems. The first one was um, data analysis. So, so we developed this. We developed this approach. We developed a, a sort of a capability, and it was allowing us to do what we thought was really neat research. And you know, so addressing some questions that were really interesting to us, and we were applying it, you know, even more broadly than that. Um, but there were two major bottlenecks. The first one was the data analysis. I mean, we. If we run these systems continually, we've got three of them, um, we can be generating sort of five, six terabytes of video per day. Um, and that's without kind of like really pushing it and um, pushing it to the max. So so, so the, the volume of, of video was, was a really significant bottleneck. And then the bottom one um, uh, is um, the, can't see, oh, cost, uh, cost and scalability. So, um, we were relying on sort of bespoke parts, um, you know, so we were, you know, buying parts from lab companies. And, and one of the things I realized very early on during my PhD was that as soon as anything is, um, you know, built for use in a lab, it seems that you can just sort of choose any number you want. Um, and it's typically a very big number. Um, and I'm not, I'm not doubting the amount of R&D and then sort of precision engineering that goes into some of the stuff we buy, but um, the price is a real uh, sort of barrier to, you know, Doing, being able to do the type of science that you want to be able to do. Um, and then the other one was around the scalability. So obviously you buy bits of equipment from different, um, different lab companies and they all talk different languages. Um, as soon as you talk about wanting to be able to control them through anything other than the software that they come with, um, companies tend to not be all that keen, um, or at least in many cases. Um, so again, there were sort of issues there. So I'm going to deal with both of these um, the first one was the image analysis, um, and actually, this was um, 
this was a, a sort of a really pivotal period of my life because um, I became a father, um, but at the same time, we just got a grant. So we just got a, a year long grant to essentially write an entire kind of like software package to um, extract as much biologically relevant information uh, from the videos that we were generating as possible. Um, so I'd never written a word in Python. I'd sort of played with MATLAB and I've done a little bit of R, but never used Python. Um, and so um, I sort of uh, I had an agreement with my wife that um, you know I'd take on this project, um, but on the basis that I was kind of allowed to read books on Python at every opportunity. Um, and unfortunately, that included my um, yeah uh, her being in labour. Um, and she sort of made me swear that I'd always kind of like not forget this story as a way of, um, yeah, constantly being thankful to her for her support. Um, so I, I, I'm not 100% sure what, what was more stressful, the learning Python or, or labor. Um, but my son thinks it's great. Um, and any time he sees a book that in any way looks important or useful, his favorite thing is just to scribble all over it. So I'm sure that helped with the success of the project. Um, so as I've sort of described, we, we, we generate videos and those videos can be various lengths, they can be different species, but what we were trying to do was to be able to get a computer to measure everything that we would measure automatically. Um, so, sorry, get a computer to measure everything automatically that we would measure manually. So up to this point, we had relied on running experiments and then spending weeks and weeks or months and months. And we have amazing students here in Plymouth on our marine biology courses. So you know, our students were really keen to get involved. And luckily, I mean, they were happy to spend months analyzing video for us, um, which is great, but it was always a bottleneck. So the aim was to be able to be able to do all of that automatically, essentially. Um, and we largely managed it. So so we uh, we developed a, a Python package, which we called Embryo CV. And this had various sort of steps um, of, of analysis. So we, we began with sort of the segmentation of the embryo. So we segmented the embryo from the image. I essentially, we, we, we got the computer to be able to draw around it. And from that, we were able to measure its size, its shape, um, its position in the egg. So we were able to look at how, it's, how it moved. Um, and we were also interested in this idea of, okay, so how do we measure the physiology? You know, we can measure movement, and that's a really nice indicator of physiology, but, but, but what can we do to be able to measure everything else that's going on? Um, and that's where we kind of had to think a little bit harder about, about the approaches that we took. So this is a, just a, a, a sort of a, a video essentially showing the various steps. So we went from, you know, the raw video to then using various approaches to segment the, the embryo. So to be able to isolate it from, um, from the, the, the background. Um, and then we looked at things at a sort of individual pixel level and I'll touch a little bit more on that. Um, and the output was essentially, you know, that we had for every single frame of the video, we had um, a fairly rich data set of, of various aspects of the animal's physiology. And we'd then be able to integrate some of that back together to be able to look at things like growth rate or changes in movement associated with particular sort of um, uh, um, met um, metamorphoses uh, associated with particular aspects of development. So this shows in a little bit more detail what that looked like. So on the left hand side, we've got um, the embryo silhouette. Um, so from one cell here to two cells, well, I've missed that. Um, so it went from one, two, four, which is sort of the, this peak here. Um, and essentially now we're looking at the, the increase in area associated with what the computer has calculated as being its, um, its size. So you can see really nicely this kind of like exponential growth curve. Um, associated with the area of the embryo, but you also start to see a lot more noise, particularly towards the end, and that's associated with the aspect. So the embryo is a much more complex shape um, in these animals, in these snails, um, and so it does mean that you kind of get like a minimum and a maximum growth curve because obviously the shape of the embryo affects how it looks. And the other thing, like I said, we were interested in was, was physiology. So, so we did look at movement in various ways. And one of those was using approaches like um, optical flow, so motion analysis technique. So here we're tracking individual pixels or points of interest within the embryo. And that was really nice as an approach for being able to pick up, um, for example, uh, stress responses. 
So, for example, within ecotoxicology, um, if you expose these animals to something like ethanol, we'd be able to pick up um, changes in, in the way that they were moving. And um, what was nice with this approach was that it worked across species. Um, so we were able to do this in, in various species of invertebrate, but also vertebrate model. And I mentioned the idea of, sort of um, extracting as much information as possible. So this is a plot that shows sort of three temperatures, so 20, 25 and 30, and then how these changes in size, um, which I've shown before, but also movement and heart rate change through time. And what was really interesting here was that we were able to kind of like pick up how the actual sort of trajectory of development changed. So you can see that at 30 degrees, there's a very rapid increase, but there's then a, a, a actually a drop in the heart rate of the animals. Um, and so to um, the size. So these 30 degree animals actually hatch smaller than the 20 and the 25. So 20 to 25 sort of seems like a stepwise increase in most of the parameters that we measured. But then 25 to 30, you see that there's actually sort of a, a, a different trajectory occurring. And this was really interesting to us because, you know, we know that in development, everything is integrated. So, you know, the size of the animal affects how it moves and the size of the animal and its movement will affect its heart rate. And these embryos have a, a fixed amount of energy. So, you know, obviously there are going to be trade offs. You can't, you know, if you use all of the energy for one process or one aspect of your biology, you're then not going to have any to, to, to devote to others. So being able to look at this kind of um, how these various parameters responded, but together was really powerful because up to this point, um, to do this type of analysis would have required potentially a decade of image analysis. So this particular experiment was um, involving uh, 200 embryos, I think. Um, there were about 30 million images that were analyzed. Um, and I mean, the computer was able to do this in, in weeks. Um, we didn't quite have it running in real time, um, but it allowed us to really investigate the biology of these animals in, in a very different way to how we've been able to do before. And I mean, this is, these are just sort of plots that break that down in a bit more detail. 144 embryos in that experiment. Um, so we can also then look at obviously the time series, um, the time series of these animals as well. So, so I mentioned this idea of the physiology and wanting to be able to kind of do a little bit more. So rather than just measuring size or shape or even just heart rate, we wanted to be able to measure things, yeah, th things in a little bit more detail. And, and the physiology of an animal, um, particularly an embryo, is, is, is constantly changing and one embryo will not look the same as another. Um, so there are all sorts of challenges associated with most of the approaches we've tried in the past to doing this. Um, so, so the approach we, we, we took was actually to look at the fluctuations in pixel values. So we kind of like went with perhaps one of the simplest image statistics. So here we've got pixel values on the Z axis. So by pixel value, I mean how bright or dark a pixel is. So we go from zero being black to white being at the top, which is 255. And then this is the image kind of overlaid as a surface. So what you can see in this particular video is um, in the center, there's a pulsation. Um, so it keeps keeps pulsing. Um, and that's actually the heart of, of, of an embryo. So again, it's one of these snail embryos. And we can see the heart very clearly in these fluctuating pixel values. And if you look closely, you can see the heart in some of the other areas as well. So even where the heart isn't, you're still able to pick up some of that fluctuation. But as the embryo is moving, it's got kind of gut flexing. They have a radula um, in their mouth, which they use for feeding. Um, you can pick up all of those signals in these mean pixel values as well. So it becomes a really interesting approach to capture sort of complex biology. So yes, we're picking up the heart rate, but we're also picking up all of these other signals. And one of the things that we can then do with that is to um, extract physiological Data. So, for example, here we have um, heart rate of Orchestia gamorellis. So this is the um, the beach flea. Um, so long tubular heart. I don't know if that will come through on, on Zoom. But we've got a long tubular heart along the back, which is essentially like a drain pipe that's sort of pulsating. Our oh, brilliant connections. Um, so, yeah, sort of pulsating up and down. Um, and the pixel fluctuations pick that up very nicely. And we can automate that process. So we get very close to, to the manual measurement. Um, interestingly, one of the things that tends to happen with these approaches is that if there's any discordance, like any difference between manual and automated, you know, it, sometimes it's because the computer gets it wrong. Sometimes it's because we get it wrong. 
But here we actually found the difference was because there are beat to beat fluctuations in the pixel value in the in the beatings. Um, so essentially every beat has a has a distance from the next beat or a period to the next beat. And the analysis here, the, the computerized analysis was able to pick up those fluctuations. And if we look at it as a histogram, it wasn't a normal distribution. So this was showing that it wasn't a normal distribution, whereas what we'd done was kind of essentially measure the number of heartbeats in a period and then divide by the total time we'd observed them. So the computer had actually sort of in, in being different had taught us something about the biology of these animals, which we thought was interesting. And then the same approach works with um, an animal that is not just, um, it's got, a, a, so this has got a two chambered heart. So sort of two chambers um, beating in opposition um, up here. Um, and they also move around, so they move around inside their eggs, and sometimes the heart is, is visible very clearly, but other times you're sort of picking up a heart signal actually through the animal, even though you can't see it directly. So again, it was able to do a, a relatively good job. And then um, most recently, so we've got um, a PhD student in my lab, um, Ziad um, Ibini, who is um, uh, something of a, um, well, He's, he, he took a year out from his degree to teach himself um, Python, um, and he's learned Python to a, an extremely impressive level. Um, and we've uh, recently published a paper um, in uh, the Journal of Experimental Biology on a platform that allows you to measure heart rate from pretty much any animal um, with a, um, a sort of transparent body. And he's tested this with, um, in, the, um, in the paper, he's tested it with uh, sea squirts, snails, and shrimp. Um, and using this particular approach, it not only measures the heart rate, but it also identifies it. So one of the uh, one of the downsides of the approaches we've used before is you had to give it a lot of manual kind of guidance in terms of knowing what frequencies to look for with the heart. Whereas he's developed a much more sophisticated approach to doing this, so essentially looking at um, flip, uh, pixel fluctuations, but at a sort of individual pixel level. Um, so that's a, a, a paper that's worth worth a look. And I, I mean, everything we do is released open source, and the same same is true of this. And the documentation is is really thorough. Um, so it's definitely one to check out. Um, and obviously, speak to us if, if you get stuck. Um, so 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 we can use fluctuating pixel values to measure physiology. To so to measure, for example, heart rate. Um, but um, we were also interested in using them to kind of try and capture everything else. Um, and so for that, we're using what we call energy proxy traits. So it's the amount of energy within different temporal frequencies in pixel fluctuations. So on this particular video, if you um, if you can sit on, um, it's not a video, so it's a still taken from a video, but then we've essentially overlaid what these pixel fluctuations, these mean pixel values look like. So you, hopefully you can see a sort of relatively high frequency signal, and that's the signal associated with the heart. But you can also see lower frequency signals like these sort of like gross movements um, or, you know, here we've got a muscle flexing as the essentially the snail pulls its shell down over its head. So it's sort of like, you know, um, using some of the, the behaviors that you'd expect to see in an adult. Um, so we were interested in this as an approach. So could we just capture rather than sort of looking for the heart, which we know knows beats with we know beats with an approximate frequency. Could we just try and capture everything and analyze energy across a frequency spectrum um, and it turned out that we could so um, so the amount of energy in these um, sort of frequency spectra were a really good indicator of survival so this was a really big experiment with sort of 300 embryos at different life stages um, and we were able to um, and these were put at 36 degrees so a, a high temperature for this animal um, but we were able to then model essentially the probability of survival um, within a population and show that that was very life stage specific. And we're also able to take these energy proxy traits and this sort of spectra. Um, and one of the advantages of the approach is that you get a lot of data. So by it being a spectra, we've got amounts of energy at sort of everything from like 0.01 hertz up to sort of 12 hertz. So you get a, a huge amount of information um, about the phenotype, albeit as energy uh, across frequency values. Um, and so here, what we did was to collapse all of that information down and to then look at whether we could use that as a way of kind of um, separating animals on the basis of the treatment that they're put in. So um, and, and whether we could do this across developmental stages. And that's what we show here. So 
This was a plot again with, with the snails. Um, so three temperatures um, all the way through their development. So from the first cell division right up until hatching. So, you know, almost um, sort of two weeks of development um, shorter in the higher temperature. Um, and there was really clear clustering just on the basis of this sort of spectra of frequency values when we applied it to something like a PCA. And then the final one, which I'll, I'll jump through very quickly because I'm conscious of time, um, was a work we did with prawn, um, uh, Palaemon serratus. Um, and again, this was kind of like a multi-stressor study. So we had temperatures and salinities and different life stages. And we were able to use these energy spectra to actually kind of analyze how these animals responded to these conditions over a 12 hour period. And it was interesting as we sort of developed the approach to this analysis, that you were able to kind of like, for example, in the heat map, pick up these um, sort of stripes associated with heart rate, um, pick up really kind of extreme responses at the extreme temperatures. So for example, there was very little other than heart rate. Um, and like some of the more subtle um, subtle responses in the middle temperatures, whereby there was that kind of shift in, in heart rate. So as the animal shifted in heart rate from one frequency to another, um, you could actually sort of pick that up in these, um, in these time series. And I've talked through this one already. So um, the next um, the next um, challenge was the cost and scalability. So I've just got a, a, a few more slides left. Um, so I've already touched on this idea that the old system, we, you know, we could do some really cool stuff with it, but it's expensive. We wanted more. We didn't have enough money to buy all of the bits. And a lot of the bits have become even more expensive as the equipment becomes more, more specialized. It really importantly, they weren't entirely open source and they weren't hackable. So every time we sort of thought, oh, it'd be really cool if we could do this. And then you'd realize that you can't do that because it's a sort of closed source driver. Um, and we also didn't want to have to always use engineers to be able to make the equipment that we wanted to use. So um, we're really lucky in that we, um, we, have, we have a lab on campus, on the university campus, but we also have a workshop at a local science park and here we have lots of 3D printers, which we use to produce essentially pieces of equipment. And this has been the major sort of um, shift, particularly in my, um, over the last sort of three or four years in my role, in that we're now able to sort of go back and actually redesign parts um, using 3D printing. Um, and that's not just a time saver, but it actually allows us to do science completely differently. So we've now built a kind of a new, an essentially a new version of this open VIM, um, so we're calling it the Lab Embryo Cam, and this is going to be released imminently under a fully open source license. Um, so it is low cost. Um, you know, it's open source. It's hackable. Um, pretty much anything on here, other than the sort of the metal parts, the optics, and the sort of the electronics, are three D printed. So we have tried to use three D printing as heavily as possible because it's a way of getting technologies you know, across the world, um, you know, without needing to send things in person, but also a way of really sort of pushing updates and driving innovation. And it's scalable. I mean, we've built this at the moment to sort of scan a multi-well plate, but there's no reason it couldn't be sort of two, three times the size. Um, in terms of the, 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 the technology itself, I mean, it's built around, a, um, it will run on any kind of Ubuntu Board, single board computer, but um, we've, we've been testing it with Raspberry Pi. Um, we've also tested it with um, AI enabled machines like the Jetson Nano. So if you wanted to do sort of real time AI, um, it's capable of, of running um, systems that would allow you to do that. Um, and the, sort of the motion is all provided by uh, sort of 3D printing um, sort of ideas. So the idea of like core XY, so we're using stepper motors and belts and we're using limit switches. Um, and we're getting accuracies of sort of a couple of microns, which for the scale, the magnification we work with is great. I mean, we don't need to go down to sort of 0.1 or 0.01 microns. And it is extremely versatile. So we've built in X and Y movement, but also Z, so we can do autofocus. Um, we've got the manual control on the front. And all of the software has been written by um, Ziad, um, my PhD student, um, in a sort of a dash um, Format. So essentially, it's a, of a dash um, server that will run on the Pi and allow you to kind of control the system and to set up time lapse experiments, essentially. Um, we've in integrating this with incubation chambers, so a low cost 3D printed incubation chamber. So you can sort of put a plate in it, pass humidified air in, and rely on the temperature of the room to kind of maintain a particular condition. And longer term, we're working towards a more dynamic environmental control. So using 
microfluidic um, style approaches as well. And then we built another piece of technology to kind of sit alongside this, and that this is what we're calling the field embryo cam. So essentially, it's a comparable technology. It allows us to put this machine out into the field to image developing embryos over a prolonged period. So we're using a Raspberry Pi uh, Zero, so a, a sort of smaller Pi, um, integrated with a GSM communication and power control. And the way that this works is essentially um, it sleeps until it needs to acquire a video, for example, every hour. Um, it will then wake, capture the video, do some uh, video analysis, send us the data back to the lab. It's also measuring things like temperature, dissolved oxygen and pH out in the environment. Um, and what's really nice about that is it means that we're able to start moving towards the idea of simulating the environment in the laboratory, um, but also kind of like using that information to be able to dynamically control experiments. So for example, if you had an experiment running in the laboratory and it was a warm day out in the lab, you could, I'm sorry, out in the field, you could actually get that kind of get those conditions simulated um, in the in the lab. And what's nice about the approach we've taken is because it's all very open and hackable, you know, you're able to feed in, for example, temperature data, or you're you're able to look at how the animals are responding out in the environment and then sort of do something comparable um, in, in, in the lab. So, uh, so this is kind of where, where we're at in terms of the technologies at the moment. We've got these, these two devices both heavily 3D printed, um, open source, tried to do it as, as sort of cost effectively as possible. Um, inevitably, the innovation is going to kind of continue in terms of lowering the cost, um, you know, making things more efficient. Um, the uh, embryo system, the lab embryo system is designed, you know, that you could have many of these running. Um, you know, so the aim is to be able to have these as a global network of devices not just for sort of climate science, but also, you know, recording the development of large numbers of different species for the sake of it, um, because that seems like a worthwhile endeavor. You know, we do not know what the development of many species look like, and that seems like something we should know as biologists, particularly given the kind of global biodiversity crisis. Um, and the field devices we're interested or in, we've received interest, um, you know, in, in sort of industrial applications. So could embryos be used as biosensors? Um, if we put systems out in the environment, um, you know, could they be used as early warning systems? Uh, you know, if a temperature, um, particular uh, temperature threshold is reached or even um, associated with a particular sort of industrial process. Um, so lots of applications there. And that that's not including the sort of the educational components. What's nice about both of these is that they are accessible to students and we have tried to make them as accessible as possible but particularly at the embryo field system what's nice about it is that we can stream data via gsm and we can actually sort of have that as a public dashboard so that people when they come to the shore can scan a qr code and see what the development of an animal that's there on the shore actually looks like and that feels really important because we can talk as much as we, or I can talk as much as I like about how sensitive early life stages are, but if you can't actually see that for yourself, um, that's really difficult. And certainly in terms of sort of climate and climate change and public awareness of climate change, I think it's only people sort of realising and being able to engage and visualise that process um, that we start to see change. OK, so um, I feel like I've, I've, I've talked a lot. Um, I think that's everything um, I've got to say. So I'd like to thank um, funders, obviously. So um, UKRI, um, University and the Science Park, um, and it was also uh, NERC, who fund environmental science in the UK. Um, and I mean, everything I've presented, I've sort of presented pretty much as, as my own. We've got a really big, um, you know, sort of dynamic research group and everything that I've presented is very much a team, um, a team effort. So, um, yeah, so that's that, that's the end of my my talk. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Oliver, for your presentation. And. Um, I immediately had a, a few questions, although I invite also people in the audience, uh, please raise your hand and, and we can uh, get a few others uh, going as well. We, I think we have time to, to answer a few questions. So, but I let me start by, well, besides all of the um, um, interesting biology that you can study from these movies, I wanted to ask you, so it seemed uh, most of the data you showed, um, I thought they were white light images, is that right? So I'm wondering if, if do you use uh, fluorescence and if the systems that you are using, I mean, I mean these instruments, 
are they also able to record, for example, um, you could use, uh, besides just structural markers with, with fluorescence, I guess you could also use functional markers that show you, for example, I don't know, maybe the calcium waves in the heart and, and some other types of data like that. So have you done any, any of those measurements? Are, are these instruments able to do them? Yeah, I mean, we haven't done any of that. Um, and it's something that, um, yeah, I mean, in, in theory, there's no reason why it couldn't be done. Um, you know, I mean, there's there's no reason why the sort of the, everything is very modular. So like the optics holder could be modified to essentially take any kind of, um, you know, any kind of camera, any type of lens. Same is true of the, of the lighting. Um, if there's not enough space, I mean, increasing the size of the instrument is as simple as kind of cutting aluminium to a different length. So, you know, the scale is, 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 is very versatile. One of the things that we're particularly looking at at the moment is uh, measuring oxygen, um, but in situ. So the I, so, so what I mean by that is to be able to do respirometry alongside the imaging. Um, so, so we're working on approaches for that, but we up to now haven't done anything with kind of fluorescence for sort of like functional imaging. But I think it would be really a really kind of cool thing to explore. Thank you. And I wanted to ask you also about uh, these instruments when you, so it's clear already everything you explained that uh, when you have the open source and modular designs, then they become more hackable, more scalable. So, but uh, another aspect of, of it being open source, I wanted to ask, uh, so have you interacted with other people who are interested in similar designs, for example? Have, uh, are you collaborating with anyone who is uh, replicating parts of the system somewhere else? Or, or do you have contributions from other research groups into these designs? Um, yeah, so at the moment, I mean, we've had, um, at the moment, we've got lots of interest from people who want to use it for their own research. Um, and that's the main, that's our main kind of like push is, um, you know, particularly within the sort of life sciences world, um, people are wanting to do research with early life stages um, and typically don't have access to the types of technology that would allow them to do it. So, um, so we're starting to work a lot more in aquaculture. So we've got a project starting on that in January. Um, we're starting to work a lot more in um, sort of trying to actually get the technologies out because there seems to be a, a big you know, you can make something open source, but that doesn't mean that it's accessible to people to use it and to build it, because actually there's quite a lot of expertise associated with that. So, so we, we're trying to sort of develop a bit of a mixed model at the moment, whereby it's completely open source. And I mean, we, we want people to build them and to use them. We're in no way protective of it. But is there also an opportunity for us to actually build them and send them to people as a, as a product, as a service, as a prototype, whatever that looks like, if it helps them get out there? Because... We were at a conference um, earlier this week and um, sorry, not earlier this week, last week. And, um, um, you know, we've got lots of people in the US who say it'd be absolutely great. And, you know, I love the idea of 3D printing, but I mean, I've never used a 3D printer. And, you know, actually, I just quite like one that I, I know will work. So 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 that's kind of our big our big drive at the moment. Um, I mean, I've watched the open source hardware space really closely. And I mean, we've, um, you know, we, we, we agreed as a group sort of five or so years ago that that is the way, I mean, we, everything we do, we want to be open because, you know, that seems to be, the science is moving too fast for it not to be, but also it's, it's what sort of feels feels right to us as, as a group. Um, but at the moment, I've not seen anything that's, I've seen some really cool systems come out, but I've not seen anything that's kind of like this scale that allows you to do this kind of like environmental work with a multi-world plate. Um, but I might be wrong if something exists already. <laughs> Thank you. So do we have any other questions from the audience? I think we have time for maybe a, one or two more questions. So um, Pierre, you have your hand raised. Please uh, unmute and go ahead with your question. Pierre, are you there? Oh, there's a 
I'm sorry. Now there's a, I think that was a security setting, but now Pierre, can you unmute yourself? Okay, yeah. great. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I can hear you. <laughs> okay, thanks. So yeah, um, thanks Oliver. Uh, um, an interesting uh, talk today. Um, I, I was uh, curious about the interface that you have for this last design that you share. So you only can control the this all set up uh, using the joystick and buttons, or do you also have a software interface to to control and run the experiments uh, using the platform? Yeah, so the the um, the platform's been developed in Dash, and the the manual interfaces are only for sort of setting up the experiment. So, for example, find the position of your first well, um, and then you can auto populate the rest, and then tell it how you want that experiment to run. So, you know, we typically run thirty second videos every couple of hours um, for each embryo, and the system will then run on a loop, um, you know, for as many iterations as you tell it to. So, so yeah, the user interface has got that kind of like experimental control aspect and it's designed to be autonomous. I mean, the joystick, it, we, we started thinking we don't need a joystick and a key and a, you know, keys because, you know, that sort of defeats the purpose, but actually in terms of setting it up, it's a huge, huge advantage. So. Okay, great. So um, in, in this case, because you, you mentioned that you eventually want to, to measure like several parameters or maybe if you, you want to, to, I don't know to add more more sensors to to this platform. So um, I guess this software uh, would allow you to 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 measure and to to allow users to read these parameters using the this interface, right? Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Yeah, I mean the the software's been it's it's uh, I mean it's got it's grown it's big and as a, as a um, yeah, as a, as a package, but um, it's like, again, we've made it modular. So, you know, if you, if you, for example, want to support a different camera, that's relatively simple, um, you know, using something like OpenCV um, or, you know, any of the sort of Linux generic cameras. Um, and if you wanted to integrate or, or design experiments to run in a way that we've not thought of, again, you, you, you're able to do that. Um, we're also in the process of trying to scale these. So sort of having many, many systems running together synchronously um, and um, because we're using um, uh, sort of the Dash um, uh, platform in, um, in Python, um, that's also possible. So you're able to sort of control many systems from a, a sort of central, um, yeah, central computer. Um, so that's the, that's the goal here. Uh, okay, uh, and just maybe share a question about, because you mentioned about that you wanted to also um, to use microfluidics maybe yeah. in some experiments. So it means that um, maybe in this same interface, you will control like pumping system or other peripheral devices around this. Yeah, um, so so what I'd like to be able to do with the microfluidics, and this is really early stage at the moment, um, but I'd like to be able to dynamically control the temperature. Um, so we want to be able to control the temperature of the water, um, you know, essentially flowing over animals. Um, and with that, yeah, we, we, we want to control the heating and cooling, but also the, um, the, the pumping. Um, so that's the sort of, that's the next big step of, um, of, of R&D for us. Um, and they will sort of sit or, or, or you know, we'll, we will try to integrate as much of that control into the user interface as possible, because, um, yeah, it sort of makes sense to then be able to integrate that with the experimental, you know, the, the, the image analysis and the image acquisition. Okay, thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much. I think uh, in the interest of time, we can close the questions here, but I would like to thank everyone for attending, especially Oliver for uh, telling us telling us about your work. And for everyone, um, please uh, contact uh, Dr. Oliver Tills at Plymouth or some of the websites shown in, in the links here or in our project Libre Hub uh, in order to connect with any of these um, initiatives or, or learn more information. So thank you very much. Um, we'll be sending information about our new, our, our following seminars in the series. If, if anyone connected here doesn't uh, know about our project, uh, we'll, we'll uh, share information also in the, in the YouTube channel where this uh, video will be uploaded. So thank you very mm -hmm. much. Any, any uh, closing words, Oliver? 
I think no, just um, I mean, as a as an initiative, I mean, this seems an amazing um kind of um thing to facilitate um and kind of giving me lots of ideas for trying to set up something not dissimilar in in my own country. So I think it's great and definitely something I'll watch watch closely. So, but uh, thank you everyone for for coming on. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.